If you're anything like me, you live under a rock and you don't really know what goes on in the world. But because I have a YouTube channel now and a lot of you tell me what's going on in the world, I get to see some different things. We have a trend twin who has had an absolute diabolical disaster happen to his body. One of the worst injuries that a person could probably receive. Talking about Mike, I can't actually remember what the other one's name is, but we're referring to Mike here. And Mike recently had his pec tear, lifting an astronomical amount of weight. I think that's one, two, three, four, five six plates he's benching six plates per side that doesn't that's fucking astronomical first of all i'm trying to get to four plates per side myself right now six is insane in this video basically what i want to do is walk through some things that mike could do if he cared to watch this video to improve his shoulder recovery and make sure that he can get back to training as soon as possible a lot of people are saying that this is his end and rip mike and he's gonna lose all his muscle now and that's absolutely not true in fact he could recover from this quite quickly if he had the right protocol in place but the best protocols come with the best prevention. So first, let's talk about what he did wrong. The first thing is warming up. And I think everyone kind of knows this universally. But the, the funny part here is, is that just listen. If, you, <laughs> if there's no like potential danger, though, it's not fun. So like, that's why I usually don't warm up. He like just said, basically everything that was wrong and uh, how the pet got torn. He talked about like warming up being boring and warming up is where it's a waste of time essentially and it's hilarious that this was five days before this actually happened and he has torn his pec now so that's the first thing if you're going for a pr or any kind of maximal lift in any kind of situation always warm up your muscles and, and specifically tendons and ligaments need to literally get warm and expand before you can do these things it's like if you took a rubber band that was hyper contracted and, or just a great example if you live in colder climate or if you have a freezer put a rubber band in a freezer then have one outside if you want to do a split test then take the rubber band that's outside of the freezer and then pull it and see how far it goes before it snaps now grab the one that's in the freezer after it's been in there for 30 minutes an hour pull it and see how long it can stretch before it snaps and it usually will just snap right away because it's unable to stretch it's contracted this is the same case with ligaments and a lot of the times why warming up and getting blood flow can be super critical obviously that's not a huge science breakdown but it's a good idea or at least a metaphor for you to understand that it's critically important to warm up the other thing is you should not be lifting this much weight to be honest unless you're competing like actually at a meet doing an event lifting this much weight is just gonna always end up completely wrong a, a huge mistake here is that people often lift this amount of weight thinking that you know it's going to be cool to hit a pr but when you're actually working with strength-based athletes professional power lifters professional strongmen they don't really do their max lifts until they're really fucking at the events right like that's where they actually start to throw it around everything leading up to that is very sub max and definitely way far out it's very very sub max and it's just building up the strength and the movement pattern overall but if you just go balls deep into a huge pr like this you're always going to fuck some shit up. Even if you do it perfectly, you can talk to anyone who hits PRs regularly or even like not regularly at all and whenever they do it they always walk out of it feeling beat the fuck up now thank god he had some spotters because if that had happened and there was no one spotting him he would be absolutely guillotined and fucked but moral of the story is make sure you're warming up and certainly just make sure you're not lifting with an ego and trying to be an ass at the gym but now that the injury has happened what can he do to fix this injury as quick as possible to get himself back into the gym and make sure that he's able to train sufficiently to continue to build or at least maintain his mass when i think about this there's really four things to use that would really exponentially increase his rate of recovery actually maybe more i'm just going to list them non-numerically and not even in a list of importance but this is exactly what i would do for a recovery protocol first i look at nutritional intake and i make sure a person is eating enough proline which is an amino acid you can get it from beef bone broth beef gelatin powder collagen protein different things like this and this amino acid is specifically responsible for the development of those soft tissues around joints, specifically tendons and ligaments, and obviously really damaged structural tissue within a muscle. Usually the way I would facilitate getting this in a diet is using collagen powder or collagen peptide specifically and using beef bone broth in meals where I have rice. Also, you can do this just by eating meats that are close to bone. We don't typically do that anymore. We have meats that are away from bone. And in most societies in which people are really healthy, you can see that they commonly eat meats around bone. And this actually gives them more calcium and more of this proline and specifically more collagen within their meats. 
The other thing is I'm going to be suggesting that he does use a hefty dose of collagen peptides. I know I just kind of talked about that, but this would be something like 30 to 40 grams per day with about one to two grams of vitamin C when he does eat that. Now, the reason we do this is because collagen peptides are incredibly responsible for improving soft tissue recovery, not just of muscle tissue, but of all tissues. And because collagen protein has a ton of glycine and proline, it's going to help those soft tissues, specifically muscle, tendons, and ligaments repair much quicker. Plus, collagen also reduces inflammation around specific injury sites, which is a really cool and important feature of it that I don't think a lot of people actually leverage. The next thing I would do would be starting to leverage BPC-157. BPC is a pretty popular peptide that is, well, pretty popular peptide that is used to increase soft tissue recovery. And it's become super popular coming in many different formulations from oral to injectable and to now even intranasal. What it does in short is accelerate tissue repair, decrease localized inflammation, which seems counterintuitive, but because it's a growth peptide, it's actually causing the growth that the inflammatory response would initiate. And what's really cool is it'll even promote the development of new blood vessels, which gets more nutrients localized to the injury area. As a general dose, people usually use around 200 to 500 micrograms intramuscularly injected of BPC-157 per day. But what I typically do is localize the injection subcutaneous or intramuscularly around the injury site and try to promote as much localized recovery as possible. I usually start at the lower end with some kind of injury like this, 200 micrograms every other day, and then scale up across four to five weeks as needed, up to 500 micrograms every day, depending on the severity of the injury. Now, knowing Mike, he might just wanna to go to the extreme end of this and blast away with 500 micrograms per day, into which I say, hey, it's probably gonna work just as well. Of course, whilst doing this, you need to ensure proper rehab, so you can't just inject it in isolation and then not move the thing. You have to be actively trying to move through active ranges of motion and not just making that arm useless and inject peptides into it, expecting it to recover. And then there's thymosin beta 4 TB 500. It's another pretty powerful peptide. God, I keep doing this pretty powerful peptide that is effective at treating things like this soft tissue damage. It works very similarly to BPC 157 in which it improves blood vessel development of new blood vessels, mind you, which is really, really critical to improving recovery rates, but also a new development of cells, which kind of sounds bad in one hand, because that sounds like cancer, but if controlled in, in appropriate areas, like inflammation, inflammatory sites, it's actually really responsive to improving recovery. I would say that TB500 over BP157 is more specific for the use of tendons and ligaments. And in this case, it would be the one that I'm leveraging more so than BPC157. Now, what makes TB500 or thymosin really impressive is it reduces scar tissue development, something that's hypercritical for someone who's going through a issue with a muscle, an injury that they're going to plan on using after a surgery has been done. It essentially helps muscles, tendons, ligaments recover more cleanly without having all that mucky scar tissue that's going to interrupt movement patterns and functionality later in life. Typically with something like this, again, I start lower and titrate up and it's going to be around 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams, about three to two times per week for the first couple of weeks. And then titrating up across an eight week period up to even five milligrams twice per week at the really extreme side of things when injuries are terribly bad. But then once you've loaded it in a sense where those growth mechanisms are happening at an efficient rate, there is some research to suggest that you can back off at a more maintenance dose for an additional six to eight weeks and see a kind of continuous effect that was had at that higher dose. Essentially stacking TB500 and BPC157 is a killer combo because they both effectively do something very similar, but also different in the same breath. And then you combine that with appropriate nutrition and you really are maximizing the recovery of tissues like his pet. Now, with the money that Mike has from all his Instagram and YouTube popularity, there's a ton of different supplements that he could afford in which you and I might not be able to afford at all. One of those being Incrolex, IGF-1 essentially. And localizing an injection of IGF-1 to the affected area at least twice per week is going to be exponentially crazy with how it will affect recovery. Something as simple as 150 micrograms to 200 micrograms injected in that area intramuscularly twice per week will literally have this man recovered by a couple of weeks. If Mike was to do this exact protocol 
from day one post op, he would be back in the gym within two to three weeks in no time, which sounds astronomically crazy, but this is literally what Wolverine would be taking if he had to. At the end of it all though, I think a lot of this could have been tackled in the front end and he just simply could have avoided using such high loads and also probably decreased his anabolic load so that strength isn't exponentially increasing because as we know, soft tissues don't all grow at the same rate and specifically with muscle tissue and strength development, which is more of a neuronal adaptation, those things will come much faster than will your ligament and tendon adaptations, especially when using anabolics. So you can develop strength, but not necessarily have the integrity to handle that strength. And this is exactly what we saw with Mikey. If you like this video, comment down below. We do offer coaching. Links are in the description, as well as we do have a private Discord group for everyone who is interested in supporting this channel, which those links are down below as well.